And eventually we're going to see some of that revelation stuff again. Because um, Daniel, of course, prophesied all those um, kingdoms that would come. That we studied in Revelation. That was prophesied in Daniel. So we're going to see those uh, world empires and that big horn and little horn and the rise of the beast and all that business. We'll see that again when we get to it. Uh, so um, we'll start the study in Daniel by reviewing some history and some historical background. So I think the first thing I want to point out is that there are three other popular Daniels in the Bible. And um, one popular Daniel is, is the son of uh, King David and Abigail. And you can read about that in uh, First Chronicles chapter 3, <clears throat> if you would mind to. There was a Daniel, a priest that was associated with Ezra. You can read about him in Ezra chapter 8, if you would mind to. There's a Daniel mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 14, but his name is spelled a, little, a bit different. So there's another Daniel. And then there's a Daniel that wrote this book. And is the, the hero of this book of Daniel. Daniel was born about 621 BC. And I say about, that might be within six months to a year, one way or another. I mean, sometimes um, biblical scholars differ on interpretation of months and that kind of thing. You know, there's a Babylonian calendar, and there's an Egyptian calendar, and there's a Jewish calendar. <laughs> but um, when it comes to 620 B.C., I don't think a year or two matters much one way or another. But 621 B.C. in Judah, he was born of a noble lineage and uh, couldn't find any info as to his father, but pretty certain that he's a tribe of Judah. Our text uh, here tonight sort of indicates that. <clears throat> At the time of Daniel's birth in 621 B.C., the Assyrians were in control of uh, all of Israel. And of course the Assyrians coming from Assyria, Assyria are from the north up here. I'm not sure I've got another map that would show us that. But um, Babylon and the Assyrian Empire from the north would be up here, and the Tigris Euphrates River would be over here in Babylon and Babylonia. So they're to the like, northeast of, of Israel. So at the time Daniel was born, the Assyrians basically have an empire going on. And that would be in control of most of the known world. And so a point of history is that the Assyrians, even though they're referred to as a empire, and some places you would read that they were a world empire, but that is not accurate. Uh, they never were a world empire. They certainly were in control of a lot of land, but they never could con fully control Egypt. And Egypt, of course, is way down here. And then there was uh, tribes and stuff all around. They never totally subdued. And so they were certainly an empire, but not a world empire. The Babylonian Empire was the first world empire. They controlled Egypt. They controlled everything that was known. And then, of course, the Mede-Persian Empire came after that, and they controlled the known world. And then Alexander the Great came along, and he controlled the known world. It's a world empire. And then the last world empire was Rome, the Roman Empire. Ah, so... Sometimes they are referred to as a world empire, but um, I guess that's a little bit tongue-in-cheek. Technically, they were not a world empire. 
based on what I just said. <clears throat> His father, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's father, uh, who was the first world empire, Babylon, was Nebuchadnezzar, and he rebelled against the Assyrians in 626 BC, and he overthrew the Assyrian capital of Nineveh, and that would be located on the Tigris Euphrates River over this way. And um, then he defeated the rest of the Assyrian army um, with help from the Egyptian army at a famous battle called Carchemish in 605 BC. So Daniel's born in 621, the Assyrians are in control. And then Nebuchadnezzar, who is Nebuchadnezzar's father, he's the one that starts the rise of the Babylonian Empire. And then Nebuchadnezzar uh, takes his place when his father passes, which actually takes place just before they siege Jerusalem um, in 604 BC. And so remember now, we're talking about BC. Um, we call this the birth of Christ. Creation is about 4,000 BC, and so the numbers get smaller coming this way, right? So if um, if Daniel was born in 621 BC, then he besieges Jerusalem in 604 BC, and that's when um, Daniel was taken captive. So. You know, it comes comes this way, obviously. Uh, so in 626, um, the Assyrian um, Empire was was uh, in control, and then Babylon started rising to power. And then at the Battle of Carchemish in 605 BC is when um, Nebuchadnezzar's father basically rose to power. And then he dies, Nebuchadnezzar takes over. And so here we are then at the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has come to Jerusalem to besiege it. Uh, so while Nebuchadnezzar then is in the area and in the mood, he just besieges Jerusalem, right? I mean, they just whipped everybody else and might as well take these guys too. And so this is right after his father has passed away. He goes home to visit that, and he comes back and um, besieges Jerusalem. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar is now king at 605 B.C., and um, his father, Nebuchadnezzar, has, has died. All right. Now, when this takes place, the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar is on the verge of being the first world empire. Egypt was still in control. And so Nebuchadnezzar goes to Jerusalem to besiege it. Now Jehoiakim is a vassal king of Egypt. Egypt has done been in control of Judah. Remember the Syrians took the northern kingdom in 726 B.C., so 726 B.C., the northern kingdom falls, and then in 604, the uh, southern kingdom, which is Judah, falls. And in this time, Egypt is in control uh, somewhat, and Jehoiakim is a puppet king referred to as a vassal king of Egypt. So he's a king, but really he's just a slave. I mean, he's there to keep the peace, basically, but uh, he's owned by the Egyptians. So Nebuchadnezzar then, beginning his world empire, he's going to besiege Jerusalem and drive out the Egyptian king. And so when uh, Jehoiakim whose Hebrew name was Eliakim. That's worth writing down, I guess. Let me 
Eliakim is the Hebrew name of Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim is the Egyptian name. It's sort of like Daniel is the Hebrew name, and Belteshazzar was his Babylonian name. And so this vassal king, Jeho Jehoiakim, was renamed, I mean, his Hebrew name was Eliakim, he was renamed Jehoiakim by the Egyptian pharaoh. Alright? That makes sense? So then Nebuchadnezzar now is besieging Jerusalem. And here we are at 605, some places may say 604 B.C., but there again, it's one of them Babylonian calendar, Assyrian calendar, Jewish calendar. It's almost like, say, we go by the, our fiscal year is a calendar year, but the federal government is on a fiscal year that starts October 1, right? Some businesses and stuff have a, like when I was with the university, it was um, July 1 to June 30, it was our fiscal. And so, if you were to say, well, he was in his first year, and you were talking about a Jewish calendar, it might be the second year that he started according to another calendar. So don't get all bent out of shape if in Jeremiah you read that it was in the fourth year. Jeremiah was obviously uh, Hebrew, right? And this was written in Aramaic. So I'm just saying a difference of a year don't cause no concern for, oh, well, gosh, the Bible's just wrong. It's in error because liberal theologians have already tried that. Like, see there, the Bible is in error because in one place it says third year of Jehoiakim, and in Jeremiah it says the fourth year. And it's all about which calendar they're, they're referring to there. So no problem there. All right, so Jehoiakim uh, actually believes himself to be raised up by God but the truth is that, is that uh, he did that which was right or evil in the sight of the Lord. So he was no godly king at all. And obviously, if you're a puppet king from Egypt, you ain't going to be no godly person. You're going to be a vassal, right? You're going to be my puppet. And not only that, we're going to rename you an Egyptian name. And uh, you're going to do like I tell you to do. And you're going to sacrifice to the idols, and you're going to worship our Egyptian gods. And and if you're if you love money more than you love God, you're going to say yes, sir. Right. So that's what's going on here. All right. Jehoiakim is loyal to Egypt, who put him in power. He was not loyal to God at all. So here we are, 604, 605. Nebuchadnezzar is besieging Jerusalem, but it does not say. It does not say that he captured it, does it? To besiege a city means what? The army shows up, surround it, and the guys on the inside said, oh my gosh, the bad guys are out there. And of course what the intention is, is we're going to start again, right? But it does not say he captured it. So, getting ahead of myself a little bit, uh, this is in 604 in um, 586, I'm sure that's not, is when the temple was destroyed. And there was another time in here, um, gosh, I can't remember, was it 520-something-ish, that Ezekiel, was taken captive. So Nebuchadnezzar came this time and he takes um, Daniel and the three other boys. So they get captured and kidnapped in the first round. So this was the design of Nebuchadnezzar, right? That I'm going to besiege it and I know he's a vassal king. All I got to do is tell him what I'm going to do and he's going to bow down and he did. 
And he says, and not only that, I'm going to take all of the, uh, the king's descendants. I'm going to take the nobles, the princes, you know, all the well-educated, royal, noble people. And I'm going to take them to Babylon. Because Nebuchadnezzar was no fool. He's a smart guy. I mean, he'd done some wicked things, but Nebuchadnezzar was a great king as far as the stuff he'd done. He's extremely intelligent. So he's thinking, like, you know, these Jews, they're pretty bright. They, they are better than us in some things. They're, they're better than us in agriculture. They're better than us in music and the arts and some other things. So why not tap into what they know? And so these nobles, these descendants of the king, the, lo the royal lines, they would have been the ones that's well-educated, right? I'll grab those guys and take them back to Babylon, and I'll see what I can get out of them, right? I'll add to what we know. So he wasn't stupid. So that's exactly what's going on. So um, Nebuchadnezzar grabs Daniel and the three others, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their Babylonian names, and takes them back. And then later on, he besieges Jerusalem again, and that's when Ezekiel goes. And then when the temple in Jerusalem is actually burned to the ground and the temple destroyed, all the rest of them go. Everybody goes in. Ah, so is that sort of a picture in your mind there? Ah, so that sort of covers um, verse 1. <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar besieges Jerusalem. He does not take it. He doesn't capture it or burn it down. He just tells Jehoiakim what he's going to do. And Jehoiakim just capitulates, right? I mean, he's already a, a vassal Egyptian king. And so no problem there. Yeah, I'll be loyal to the Babylonian guys now, whoever's paying the most money. <laughs> so that's what's going on. And so and in verse 2 it says, The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God. So, you know, later on we're going to see this come up again where they took the vessels from the temple that was stored in their God's house now and drank from them. And Buddy they was having them a grand old time. And that's when the handwriting on the wall appeared, right? So we'll get to that. But what's going on here, though, is Nebuchadnezzar is saying, okay, not only am I going to take some of your guys, those, those smart guys, I'm going to demand that you give me certain articles that's in the temple as ransom. I'm going to take some money, too. We'll take some silver and gold. And so the other thing that's going on here then is Nebuchadnezzar is pretty much saying to the nation of Israel and to God that we've, we've taken over here and you couldn't do nothing about it and I'm going to take some of the vessels from the temple and put them in my God's house back in the land of Shinar as booty, in other words. Demonstrating that Nebuchadnezzar's God is more powerful than Israel's God. He would eat those words later on. So he takes some of the articles of the house of God and carried them into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. <clears throat> so the um, The articles from the temple plus the hostages were taken back to the land of Shinar, which is Babylon, which is, you know, where the Tower of Babel was built. And sometimes as you'll see a reference to Mesopotamia. That's all the same area. To the house of his God. And the singular is used here because Nebuchadnezzar believed his God, and there were many, but his God, his personal God, was the only God. And so the God that he is referring to here is Baal Merodach. It's also known as Murdoch in some places or Murdoch. It's just a difference in spelling and transliteration. 
And um, Nebuchadnezzar's father, Nebuchadnezzar, had a huge, magnificent temple built to this God. Um, and this is the God that, that Nebuchadnezzar now worships. And uh, I, I recall reading a description, but I didn't really include much of the details in my notes, but this temple that Nebuchadnezzar built for his God was about 600 square feet. It had eight towers with staircases around it, gold decorations and silver, precious stones. And of course in it were the, the treasures of the uh, Babylonian Empire. That was his bank. It stole all this gold, silver, and precious things in his God's temple that he built. It was quite, quite an edifice. Uh, so the temple vessels were taken to this place to, uh, to add to Nebuchadnezzar's wealth. And so now we wonder, why did God allow this? I mean, so here's some spiritual application, right? Nebuchadnezzar is thumbing his nose at God. See, my God's stronger than your God. We've taken over. We, we took your vessels out. We took your people. We're stronger. We're better. Why God allows this? And so this question of why has often been raised, right? Why, 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 why? And I've heard it over and over, and so have y'all. And so we do have to be able to answer, answer that. And one of the things, first things that come to my mind is that God saw it. God does what he wants. And I'm not being capricious about that. God always does what's in his perfect purpose and plan to do. And whatever God does is right. It is righteous. We have to trust the fact that what God is doing is right. It doesn't say I understand it. God says trust me on this. But what could be going on here is chastening, right? I mean, God's not going to let us continue to get away with stuff. You know, you get out of line and the Holy Spirit immediately nails you. You better listen right away <laughs> because that is God's gentle way of saying, You're messing up. You're messing up. And you just keep going down that path, God will get a little more serious. And there may be some uh, chastening going on, right? A whooping. <clears throat> I mean, a pure old-fashioned, plain old D whipping. God's not going to have it. Now, that's a good thing, right? Because God says, I'm going to discipline those who are mine. And so you get out of line and the Holy Spirit nails you for it, you might better be thankful or at least acknowledge the fact that I'm His. He ain't letting me by with that. And if you get a whooping, uh, you're just going to have to take it like a man and say, I have that one coming. And that's right. God's not going to have it now. So why would God allow this? Chaste it. For many decades, for years, decades, the prophets had warned the rulers of Judah that their idolatry and their immorality and their injustice towards the poor and the needy was going to lead their nation to ruin. Forty plus years. They wasn't listening. So judgment came. Now listen, God used the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Assyrians, to judge Israel. But what happened to the Babylonians? God used somebody else to judge them. And so God's got a plan and a purpose. And it is right. We may not always understand it. And some things you may not ever understand why we just got to trust the fact that there's there's good in it 
We just ain't discovered it yet. But God doesn't mess up. God don't make no errors. God don't make a mistake. And then later back, oh, that one's on me. You know, shouldn't have done that. No, God's perfect. He's perfectly righteous. It is in our best interest to, by faith, trust that what he's doing is in our best interest, and they'll be good to come out of it. Now, I can say that based on the authority of the Word of God, and I don't know authority of John Ed Smith. <clears throat> the prophets predicted this day would come. Isaiah chapter 13, Micah chapter 4, Jeremiah chapter 20, 25, and 27, they all predicted that this judgment was coming. They listened. Had they listened, history would have been different. We'd have been reading it all different. The Bible would have recorded it the other way. Right? Listen, God would rather have his people live in a shameful captivity in a pagan land than living like pagans in the Holy Land. That's what he said. And God will take the same position with us. He's not going to have his righteous name disgraced. He'll take people out. There have been funerals. There's been funerals. We know that God had made a covenant with the people of Israel, promising that he would bless them. In other words, he would care for them if they obeyed his word. That's the covenant. But if they disobeyed, they broke the covenant, he chased them. Now you read the Old Testament, particularly the judges' time. It's like a roller coaster, right? Israel's doing good, God's blessing. Then they start serving other gods and worshiping idols, and then they get down here, and oh, we messed up. Repent, blessing, curse chasing up and down. It's just one big roller coaster almost. Ah, so God wanted them to be a light to the Gentiles and, uh, and reveal the glories and blessings of God. But instead, the Jews became like the Gentiles and they worshiped false gods. You would think, you know, you're reading this history and everything that's taking place here, you would think they'd catch on. Well, we could say the same thing about us. You would think we'd catch on. But no, there's plenty of examples of us in our day just beating our head against the wall. And it's like, you ain't, I ain't catching on here. So we can't sort of pull a finger at them because it's like they're three fingers pointing back, ain't it? Verse 2 says that God gave Jehoiakim over to Nebuchadnezzar. This was the plan and the providence of God. And if we are disobedient, God will hand us over to some chastening or some judgment. How strange that God's own people wouldn't obey, but Nebuchadnezzar and his army did. God told them to go down there and besiege, and they did. But God's people wouldn't obey. God used Babylon to chasten Israel and Judah. And then he used the Medo-Persians to judge the Babylonians. Then Alexander the Great comes along. Then the Romans come along. His will, his purpose... And his plan is going to be accomplished. <clears throat> and it's going to get accomplished whether you on board or whether I'm on board or not. Right. If we can't be obedient and answer the call to serve, God will just bypass. He'll, he'll put people on the shelf. Doesn't have anything to do with your salvation. I ain't talking about that. But God has bypassed. You use somebody else. I mean, those rewards go to somebody else, right? 
So, his will, his purpose, his plan is going to be accomplished. We can either be on board with it or we can sit on the sidelines. When he isn't permitted to rule, he'll overrule. That's God. His will shall be done and his name shall be glorified. Hallelujah goes there. The Lord God omnipotent reigns. Where do we hear that? Revelation chapter 19, verse 6. I remember I'm somewhat of a history buff. From May to September 1787, the Revolutionary War has done come and gone, and the American Constitutional Convention is meeting in Philadelphia. And they're trying to, you know, iron out this Constitution, develop a system of government for the new nation, our new nation. So they started in May, and at the end of June, progress had been really slow. But you can imagine why. I mean, you put a bunch of uh, really intelligent guys in a room, and they all smart, they all got good ideas, that stuff has to be hashed out now. <laughs> and so this is what's going on. And um, so little progress had been made by the end of June. And so Ben Franklin, y'all recall him? him? He's on a hundred dollar bill, by the way. I don't have none of them. <laughs> Trust me, there. I've seen one. Dude. He's on there. I saw a picture of one. Yeah. <laughs> ben Franklin stands up and address addresses the new president, George Washington. He's president of the convention at the time, and he said these now famous words. He says, "Sir, I have lived a long time." And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth. That God governs in the affairs of men. Ben Franklin, 1787. Those are our founding fathers. Who we are dissing to this day. As a as a, as a society. You're, you're sure that's not the president now that said something like that? <laughs> you done gone to meddling now. <laughs> and then Ben Franklin made a motion, a formal motion, to have a time of prayer. May 1787. Franklin was a man that believed in a God who was the architect and the governor of the whole universe. And he wasn't just the only one who believed. Many others did too. A conviction that agrees with Scripture, by the way. Abraham called God the judge of all the earth, Genesis 18. King Hezekiah said, Thou art the God of all the kingdoms of the earth. 2 Kings chapter 19. Later in this book, in chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar is going to learn firsthand that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men. Often I've used the illustration that God's powerful. And if God can't get your attention, all He's got to do is touch one little blood vessel in your brain and you will be a blubbering idiot. Just like Nebuchadnezzar. God did that. Our next breath of air, God holds in His hand. And we should be thankful every single day, every morning. God is sovereign. And Nebuchadnezzar will learn that. We'll see that in chapter 4. God raised up Nebuchadnezzar and God brought him down. God raises up all leaders. Ain't nobody in power that he doesn't allow. And Carol, I know what you're thinking already. <laughs> He's there for a purpose. And that would be judgment. <laughs> <laughs> Chastisement would be my first guess. God raises up all leaders. Although we don't often see the why. Uh, sometimes it's there's a blessing in it, and sometimes it's a judgment. All right, in these two verses, we see 
<clears throat> two characters, Jehoiakim and Nebuchadnezzar. And um, we've already seen that Jehoiakim, also known as Eliakim, and you can read about him in 2 Kings chapter 23, by the way. Jehoiakim was the, uh, was the throne name. And uh, Pharaoh Necho was actually on the throne at that time. So when Babylon defeats Egypt, um, Jehoiakim immediately pledges his loyalty to Nebuchadnezzar. You know, imagine that. But later on, three years later, he did show some rebelliousness, and that's why Nebuchadnezzar came back. So, and here's Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar served as a general under his father Nebuchadnezzar and his father Nebuchadnezzar was the founder or the establisher or beginning of the new Babylonian empire and I say new because the Babylonians were warriors from way back and they have been fighting them Assyrians back into you know for a long time but when Nebuchadnezzar becomes king when his father dies and that's just prior to him besieging Jerusalem, probably 602 B.C. And, you know, he returns to Babylon to attend the funeral, to be installed as the king, and then he returns to Jerusalem to besiege it. He was a brilliant architect. Nebuchadnezzar, a very really smart, intelligent guy. He rebuilt Babylon. Uh, he expanded it. It was once just on, like, the west side of the Euphrates, but he expanded it you know, put a bridge and build up on the other side of the Euphrates River. Uh, There's an 11 mile wall surrounding the city. Uh, there was an inner wall that was uh, so wide and broad that two chariots could race side by side. And so you got this outer wall like Jericho, and then you had this real broad inner wall too. And it was specifically for that so chariots could, so if the bad guys breached the outer wall, they still had to go over that next one and there would be chariots, horsemen with archers, you know. Uh, so he was a brilliant military guy too. And uh, the walls were decorated <coughs> uh, with lions and glazed brick. And to this day, we can see in our history books uh, pictures of lions, that was a symbol of power in the Babylonian Empire. A lot of the statues and the buildings, walls would have these pictures of lions, right? And so that was a symbol then of their, their strength. His palace had a huge throne room and it was lavishly decorated in gold. Um, he built the famous hanging gardens and uh, you know the ancient world history always referred to that as one of the seven ancient wonders of the world the hanging gardens of Babylon so he was quite the builder quite the architect and um, maybe even had a little bit of green thumb in him but there were many temples for the many gods in Babylon but the most famous and important one was the temple of Murdoch and uh, another building of course there was famous Tower of Babylon and uh, that's not the Tower of Babel now it's the Tower of Babylon it was a ziggurat that was built by Nebuchadnezzar and it was about 300 feet high <coughs> seven sets of steps you know seven stories high and so he was quite the architect and builder military genius architect and builder <coughs> And where he got his green thumb, I don't know, but obviously he was, um, maybe he had a degree of soil chemistry as well, who knows. But obviously well-educated and very intelligent guy. So no doubt the captives of, captives of Jerusalem were really impressed when they go to Babylon and see this. I mean, they're born and raised in Judea, right, the hill country. And uh, they've seen the temple, which was you know, built by Solomon. It was quite beautiful. But they ain't never seen nothing like this. I mean, these towers, these ziggurats, 
the hanging top, the hanging gardens. I mean, when these guys get to Babylon, they are astonished. Very, very, very impressed. Nebuchadnezzar obviously was the greatest king of the Babylonian Empire, but it was short lived because the Medes and Persians took over in 539 BC. So just over 60 years is all his reign lasted. Uh, verse 3. <clears throat> We've, we've come across another character. So then the king instructed Aspenaz, <clears throat> Aspenaz, yeah, Aspenaz probably. And so he is the master of the eunuchs. And so we're introduced to a third character here, uh, mm -hmm. Aspenaz, and he is referred to as master of the eunuchs. All right, so a eunuch was a castrated male and uh, their primary uh, function was to manage the king's harem. And that would be for obvious reasons, right? But it wasn't necessary that um, a eunuch be a eunuch to serve in the king's court. It pretty much was, uh, you know, what position were you playing? What role did you have? And so sometimes eunuch, the Hebrew word is saris, didn't necessarily refer to a guy that had been castrated. And so it sort of depends on the context, like how you interpret the word eunuch. Um, Philip, and uh, Philip came, who was the guy that was reading uh, the book of Isaiah for Candace the Queen? The Ethiopian eunuch, I guess they just referred to him. Now he was a eunuch because he served in the Queen's so he, he was a eunuch. All right, so, but uh, they, they were considered, you know, trustworthy and but didn't necessarily have to be, um, you know, castrated. So Ashpenaz was instructed to oversee the diet and the new lifestyle of Daniel and his three friends. So what's not said here, but you can get out of reading ancient resources is that when when all these guys get to Babylon, Ashkenaz is instructed to go sort them out. And so it's his job to go see who's who's good looking, who has uh, no blemishes. In other words, he ain't blind, he ain't limping, he ain't deaf, uh, ain't got no tattoos on him. And uh, smart, right? And so he was supposed to sort out all these. And there was several different groups of them. You, you see here that Daniel and the three Hebrew boys are always mentioned together. They were a team. They were in on a team together. Right, my head, cool. <laughs> Later they did. <laughs> Later they did. For God, this is God's hand. God's hand. Of keeping them together for us. It is. There's, there's no coincidence, right, in the way God works. These three guys are together. They eat together. They basically are in a dormitory together. They raise up at the king's table all together. And so point there I would make is Surround yourself with some Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's, and a Daniel here and there. And uh, you'll fare a lot better than if you um, pair up with more worldly types. Mm -hmm. don't, don't keep bad company. Don't keep bad company. So he's instructed to oversee these guys, and there were others. There were other teams, but this team, Daniel and his three friends, are written, they're recorded because they're the ones that were heroes of God, right? Mm -hmm. So what does that tell us? The things we do for God stand. Right. And everything else is just plain baloney, right? 
So he's overseeing these guys, their diet, their new lifestyles. And um, so obviously it was Nebuchadnezzar's desire to train the best of the people uh, to serve in his government. And so here he is. He's got uh, some of these guys coming over and as as Ben has, has to short, sort them out. And this is interesting. The customs, the uh, the precedences, the prejudices, the traditions of the Chaldeans, typically written in the history books, would not allow a king to do such a thing. But Nebuchadnezzar is freelancing here. It's never been recorded in Chaldean history or Babylonian history that when you conquered a people that you would do this that you would take some of their smart people and train them in the ways of the Chaldeans that would be like what are you, you you're you going to teach the fox to guard the hen house you're going to let them infiltrate and so that wasn't a smart thing to do that was not done so this is interesting in that Nebuchadnezzar is the first one to do it guess who else done it years later Alexander the Great so he wasn't stupid either. He was, uh, that had to be Patton's great, great, great granddad. <laughs> yeah. To bring captains, captives or foreigners uh, in, into the central government, that was just not, uh, and let them serve in the king's court at the highest level of the government. I mean, that would be like allowing the Chinese well, they're already doing that. <laughs> I thought I was going to make a good point about allowing the Chinese to infiltrate our government, but that may be already happened. All right, so what Nebuchadnezzar is doing here would be a new policy. And uh, a policy, in my mind, certainly seems to be wise. So... I'm sure in, in uh, the reading I've done that Nebuchadnezzar had heard of the advances that the Jews had made in agriculture. They were gifted in, action, in musical instruments at this time. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar also knew, he also knew about their religion. And he knew that some of them Jews had the gift of prophecy. Now, how well does that fit into Nebuchadnezzar's bag of tricks? I mean, the Babylonians were the inventors of astrology. I mean, they were the inventors of fortune tellers and soothsayers. The Magi that come from the wet, from the east to visit were, were kingmakers by the time they got to Jesus' day. And when those guys showed up, Herod was terrified, right? It said the Magi showed up. They were ancient Magi from Babylon. Fortune tellers, astrologers, astronomers. And Herod was troubled. And when Herod got troubled, everybody got troubled. He knew that they... Some of them may have the gift of prophecy, so he wanted he wanted in on that too. So it's starting to make a little more sense why Nebuchadnezzar's bucking policy, right? Ancient tradition said you don't do that kind of thing, and Nebuchadnezzar wanted them wanted them in his government. So Nebuchadnezzar is doing what he can to strengthen his own nation there, and by allowing and recognizing all the talent that he can get. And so, to me, that's, that's just smart. So he had this great understanding that uh, we often say today that knowledge is power. And it absolutely is. And so Nebuchadnezzar learned that in 600 B.C., right? Knowledge is power. And so he wanted all the knowledge he could get. And that's why he's done, done this. <coughs> It'd also be wise on Nebuchadnezzar's part. You just captured this nation and you brought some of their nobles 
they're well-known people. They're princes, you know, the king, people that would be in the king's lineage. These would all be well-known people, right? Heads of tribes, you know, you get the pictures. And you bring them to Babylon, and you allow them to be a part of the government. What kind of picture does that paint? Or what kind of message does that send to everybody else that's going to come along? Well, it, it, it won't be so bad. It'll help keep the peace. Won't it? And so Nebuchadnezzar is clever, right? And so far less likely to cause trouble if they see some of their own kind up in the White House, you know, in Nebuchadnezzar's palace or in his government. And so... Uh, that would help, of course, also with communication. I mean, the Chaldeans spoke three different dialects, and so you got to be able to communicate with your subordinates as well. So now we're on verse three. We're still on verse three. <clears throat> it says that Ashtonaz was master of the eunuchs in charge of all this. Children of Israel, some of the king's descendants, and some of the nobles. And so what we have here is all the elites, right? Nobles, princes, uh, king's descendants, sons of the kings. And so these probably were um, chosen and trained for the king's court. But Daniel and the three Hebrew boys were just far superior to anything else that Ashman has come across. You know, it doesn't take you long to figure out how smart somebody is. Now, they can be arrogant, that's for sure, but you get involved in a conversation, it don't take long to find out that, you know, that person's pretty bright. And so Ashman has then has done sorted all this out, and um, there could have been, I don't know, thousands. But Daniel and his three friends, they quickly rise to the top. They're recognized. It says uh, in verse 4, uh, no blemishes. In other words, there's no physical handicap. And good looking. And it reads exactly the way you would take it. Handsome guys. So there was a high value in Nebuchadnezzar's court for these people to be Easy to look at, you know, handsome guys. I mean, it means exactly what it says. It's well translated there. Good looking. Did you say they all came from well to good families? Yes, no doubt. Well, that knocks all this out. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't have made it. We, we would have been uh, the captives at large. <laughs> we would have been praying for Daniel and his three. Uh, friends, like y'all go get them, knock, knock yourself out. Yeah. Right. So, so no blemish is a, a reference to physical handicaps. Nobody blind, deaf, lame, limps. You know, no tattoos, no birthmarks. I mean, just no blemishes. Gifted in all wisdom, and so this is more like prudent. They handled themselves well. They were mature beyond their age. And, you know, there's a difference between being smart and wise. And I can give you the best example I ever had is Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton was smart. But, boy, he wasn't wise. Now, the one that's there now ain't neither. <laughs> It says, possessing knowledge. In other words, they were well educated. And so, intelligence and knowledge is also different too. In that, you know, I'm 65 years old, and I've learned over time some knowledge. But someone with more intelligence than me could learn what I know at age 40 instead of age 65. And so these guys were well educated. That's what that reference is about, is that they've been up to all the finest private schools, the best high schools, 
the best colleges and universities. They were well, well educated. They possessed knowledge. And it says quick to understand. Now, that's pure intelligence. Now we have to face the fact that there are people who are far more intelligent than I am. Now we may can learn the same skill set, but the difference between intelligence and knowledge is how quickly you can learn new concepts. And so if a new concept comes along and it takes me a week to sort it out and get on top of it, but Kyle can do it by Wednesday, Kyle's more intelligent than I am. He is quick to understand. He catches on quick. And by then, by default then, while I'm still working on that first concept, he gets it done by Wednesday, he's on something else, right? And so intelligence then is how quickly you can understand new concepts and then go on to something else. And so over time, you're really smart. You know a lot about a lot of things. So this is what wisdom, they were well educated, they were very intelligent. Now this is going to be very important because the Babylonian language was three different dialects alone. So when you said, he, well, he's got to learn Babylonian language. No, he's got to learn, he's got to learn Assyrian, Akkadian, and Aramaic. Because they use different languages for different things. And so he, they, they were smart, quick, quick to understand. And then it says ability to serve. Now this is probably a reference to mental capacity, but also maybe a reference to physical capacity in order to hold up under the long hours of serving. And so I could just imagine that these guys were um, no blemishes, good looking, really smart, very talented, and healthy. I mean, they were strong. In our modern day, they were studs. You know, they were carved out of stone. These guys were strong. And so they had the ability mentally and physically then to serve at whatever capacity or whatever demand that the king put on. Uh, so I've got um, just a couple of minutes. I've, I've got some pretty extensive notes about the Aramaic and the Assyrian and the Akkadian languages. And so I'm just going to quit there and we'll pick up in verse... Four at the end of verse four, teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. At our next lesson, is there any any questions so far? I, got I mean, a question here, don't it? Where he's keeping them at? They're, they're telling, and we get them into it more. But they tell them, this is what you're leaving there. Have they got them in? Uh, they in the king's palace, man. I know, but are they kind of? Kept in this section. Oh, now that's an interesting question. I can tell you that. Um, because if I got a chance, I'm going to buy a I'm going to buy a grand diamond. <laughs> but these people, they can only eat what the king just told them to do. Yeah, these guys were in teams of four, and I get this from what's implied in the scripture, but reading ancient Assyrian history and stuff, that it was a a known way of doing business that you would get um, teams of four. And so Daniel and his three friends would be eating at this table. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so and like squads in the military? And another, I guess. But if you like squads in the military? So I don't know about what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got a platoon, which is 60. Then you've got your squads, which are there. And then you've got your firefight, which is a smaller group of individuals. And that you work as a team. So how many would be in a firefight? Would be four. That's what Jacob did. <laughs> <laughs> so, but later on, you can see that when it comes time to do the meals, how easy it would be to for them guys to get the vegetables, and the rest of these guys are getting pork and. I mean, you could easily, because the master of the, um, one of the stewards 
Melzar, we see him later, you know, he takes the food to the tables. And so Melzar is directly guardian of Daniel and his three friends. And so they're sitting at this table and all these teams, and this is taking place in the palace. I mean, the king is raising them up. What's implied here is that Nebuchadnezzar is brainwashing them and raising them up in his, at his table, so to speak, in his palace. So, you know, they're getting the Hilton treatment, the finest meals. I mean, probably nothing. I took good care of you and me some favors. Yeah. Well, that was the strategy, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to change your name. We're going to change your diet. We're going to change your religion. We're going to change everything so that you'll be Chaldeans and not Jews. Lord God, thank you for this class.